Welcome to Geek Mind. I'm your host, Michael Trainer, and I am thrilled to launch this conversation with the one and only Stephen Pressfield. This is the third conversation I've had the honor of having with Stephen. It was held live and it was an inspiration. Stephen is the author of such seminal classics, The War of Art, The Artist's Journey, The Legend of Bagger Vance, Gates of Fire. He has written, I think now over 30 books and most of them written in the latter half of life. And as someone who has had a lot of resistance, as he calls it, in my own creative journey. It's a profound masterclass into how we can break through resistance and step into our creative potential. Um, how can we birth the creative works that want to uh, be the expression sort of of our soul, if you will? How can we step into and get down to business as it relates to taking care of our creative craft. And he provides really tangible and actionable steps, as well as speaks to sort of his own journey in overcoming resistance, which was a long time fight. I think you'll find tremendous value in this conversation. If you find value, please share it with a friend. Uh, please go ahead and leave a rating and review. And also, uh, please pick up a copy of The Daily Press Field. It's Stephen's newest book, and it's a profound inspiration. We're going to have a quick word from our partners, and then we're going to get into this live conversation with the one and only Stephen Pressfield. But before we get into it, I just want to take a quick moment to acknowledge our partners. The first is Momentum. MomentumShake.com. Momentum is my go-to complete longevity supplement. It has everything from NAD Plus to collagen, omega-3s, sun fiber, cordyceps, all my essential minerals, lion's mane and the fruiting body of the lion's mane for cognitive enhancement hydrolonic acid, taurine, vitamins D3 and K2. It has it all and at the highest, highest quality. I absolutely love Momentum. I basically drink it every day with my blue, wild blueberries. It tastes delicious and it's got everything you need. Check them out, MomentumShake.com. This episode is also brought to you by Upgraded Formulas. Upgraded Formulas is my go-to resource for all things minerals. I did a hair test for them, realized I had heavy metal exposure, and subsequently have been working with them on getting my minerals optimized for detoxification, as well as to get my cellular health and everything firing at the highest level. I'm a huge fan of their magnesium. My deep sleep has gotten way better. I take their upgraded memory, their upgraded charge. I highly recommend you check them out. Head over to UpgradedFormulas.com and you can use Peak for 15% off your order. And without further ado, let's get into this live conversation with the one and only Stephen Pressfield. I want to reiterate Stephen's sentiment in saying thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, it means a lot to me. I've spent a lot of time with this man's words in my ears and in front of me on the pages in anticipation of this conversation. Uh, I am now honored to call you a friend, Stephen. Likewise, Michael, and thank you for you know making this possible tonight. Man, it's uh, it's a real honor. I was thinking about how I actually introduce you, and knowing also that you are, which is one of the things I love about you, you're very humble and don't like to be massively aggrandized. And so I thought that what I would share is a little bit of a story that to me encapsulates how I feel about you, which is I like to think of things musically. I love music. And one of the things that I've noticed is we all know when we're in the midst of a great song, you know, I think that's one of the things that's special about music is it cuts through and it's undeniable when something creates that resonance. And for me, there's a very clear difference in life between people who sing because they want you to see them sing beautifully and those who sing because they want to lift the collective. And to me, you are the latter. Ah, 
Oh, thank you, Michael. <laughs> so, and and I'm, not only that, I'm in it for the money. <laughs> 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 and while we go musical, I also like that you're you got the Marines and you, and you also keep it fucking real and, and you're New York about it. So it's a beautiful balance. And um, yeah, Stephen Pressfield, thanks for coming by. Oh, thanks for having me, Michael. <laughs> so I thought we'd start off by laying some some groundwork. Um, who here has read the book, The War of Art? Pretty good audience, okay. Um, that's just one of more than 20 books that you've written. Um, but what's remarkable for me is that in turning pro, you talk about the fact that you, at least in, by your own declaration, turned pro at 31. Um, but that is not when you published your first book. Can you share a little bit about why the distinction of 31 as the demarcation of the time that for you, you consider yourself as turning, turning professional, turning pro? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think the point that I would make about that was that there was a, there was a moment for me there, there is, I'm sure for probably everybody in this room where you sort of decide, you know, this is what I, my calling is, this is what I want to do. But, and a lot of us sort of expect, oh, well, everything's going to fall into place right now. You know, I made that decision. I made that change. But for me, it was like another 20-something years before I actually had a book published and a lot, a lot, a lot of bad stuff along the way. So the, the point I would make about that is just that it, it's a long road, at least for me it was. And uh, from, you know, before that turning point, you're really struggling. But even after that turning point, it still is a long a long journey, at least it was for me. Yeah, literally and figuratively, because you talk about driving in, I think it's your 65 Chevy van, something like, well, I don't know if I got the year right. No, you're right. Yeah, up. Okay, yeah, I got yeah, it. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, something like 290,000 miles. And you, and you talk about that as, a, as, a, as an aspect of an embodied aspect of your resistance, that, 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 you, were, that you were, as I interpreted it, running uh, from, from the muse that wanted to move through you. Um, can you, for those listening, share what resistance is? Can you kind of define the context of, of what is resistance? Uh, if you sit down in front of a keyboard of any kind, a piano keyboard or a typewriter keyboard or any, anything like that, that where you're going to try to do something creative, right? You're going to try, I feel at least a, a negative force radiating off of that keyboard at me, trying to stop me from, from doing what, what I want to do. And that's what I call resistance with a capital R. Mm. And when I, I mean, resistance sort of uh, kicked my ass for like 10 years or so before I even, and I didn't even know it existed, you know, this negative force. I just found that I had no, uh, you know, I was racked with self-doubt. I, I was totally fearful. I was procrastinating. I was distracting. I doing all those things that we all do, right? Before I sort of realized that uh, there is this negative force out there, there is this demon, there is this dragon, and that just giving it a name for me, you know, like I say in the start of the War of Art, if you've ever bought a treadmill and brought it home and let it sit in the attic, you know what resistance is, right? Or if you've ever sat down and tried to write anything long form or, you know, done anything, um, I'm looking at my friend Victoria here, who I know she had a long, long battle with it. And, uh, you know, you all know what resistance is. So anyway, that was for me, identifying that and giving it a name was that was the moment nine to 30 at 31 that uh, I felt like, OK, now I have a handle on at least what I'm fighting and at least that there is something that I'm fighting. But then, like I say, it still was many, many years before the rest of it caught up. Yeah, you, you said something really beautiful, which you says the fear with which a potential new book or startup or enterprise strikes us is directly proportional to how important the enterprise is to the evolution of our soul. And that really resonated with me. And you also share, at least in my understanding, that the resistance is commensurate with the degree to which that can be an evolution of our soul. Like, in other words, yeah. The more significant the dream, the more significant the vision, the more insidious and clever 
that dance becomes and in terms of of all the ways resistance will fuck with us is that is that accurate and and yes and and, and in that <laughs> and having danced now in in that dance for for some time does it get any easier uh well it never gets any easier for me in fact what i found is that uh, we've talked about this michael that resistance is a really diabolical force and I'm convinced that it has its own intelligence. You know, it's not, it's a force of nature like gravity, in my opinion, but it's beyond that. You know, it's, it's the devil, you know, I mean, it constantly changes shape. It's a shape shifting thing. And what happens for me is that resistance becomes kind of more nuanced as I get farther and deeper into the game. You know, I've been, I've been, you know, finding my way around it for, you know, 30 something years, but it's still, finds new ways to fuck with my head, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. Um, going back to what you said before about um, the, the level of resistance is commensurate to the, to the importance of the project. This is kind of one of the principles that, that I believe in is in the war of art that um, the more important a project, let's say you have an idea for a book or a startup or an album or whatever it is, the more important that project is to your evolution, to your soul evolution, the more resistance you'll feel to it. If you have some shitty little idea that doesn't really matter, there won't be any resistance at all, you know? But if you've got, you know, your white whale, your Moby Dick type of thing, there's gonna be massive resistance. So the good news of that, and we've talked about this a bunch of times, is if you're feeling massive resistance to something, it's a good sign because it shows that there's that dream inside you that resistance is trying to stop you from doing. So I always feel like when I'm experiencing those symptoms, you know, it's a good sign. I try to, t you know, I have to tell myself that, but you know, it encourages me that I'm onto something or I wouldn't be feeling, you know, all this negative energy. Yeah. I, I want to let me, let me ask you something. Please, Michael, Cause please. I want, we should make a conversation. I know that, you know, podcasting and that sort of stuff has been kind of your your thing. What form has resistance taken for you? Or what, and was there a moment for you that like that 31 year old moment for me? Yeah, I would. So I would declare this moment as that in, in certain this ways, which, which I'm going to get to ah. in a second. So so I'll, I'll rewind. Um, it's a beautiful question. So for me, launching the podcast was a massive exercise in resistance. I don't know if anyone can relate, whatever that is for you, your book, your show, your podcast. So I started recording my podcast in 2014. Ah, really? I did not launch my podcast ah. until 2019. Ah. Um, and it took me, I don't know if I shared this with you in one of our breakfasts, but it took me actually, I, I took myself on a date to go see Fleetwood Mac here at the forum. And there was a tribute to Tom Petty. And I love Tom Petty and I wanted to go see him this, that the year, that year, but I was like, Oh no, I'll catch him next year. You know, uh, it's too uh, far to drive east side. Uh, it's an uh, hour in traffic. Fuck it. And of course he passed away. And so I'm watching this tribute to Tom Petty as I'm on a date by myself with Fleetwood Mac, which, uh, which was not actually a depressing thing. It was very beautiful. Uh, <laughs> Stephen Nicks is still the jam. Uh, but as I watched Tom Petty in this tribute, it was no, it was undeniable that he was singing his song, you know, uh -huh. that was a man. And so you talk uh -huh. about like, I love how you write about like, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll lay out a body of work like Bruce, Bruce, Spring, Bruce Springsteen and all his songs or, or Bob Dylan and all his songs. It's like, it's undeniable that that's a body of work. And when I saw Tom Petty free fall and, you know, on down, I was like, that's a body of work. And that man like his music or not, he took a shot. Like he sang his fucking song. And in that moment, I, I declared tomorrow I'm publishing my uh, podcast. Uh, uh, and I was sitting on like, not, but I had done an event with the Dalai Lama. I mean, I had like incredible uh, conversations uh, that were sitting in a drawer for five years. Uh, and I was like, I don't care if two people show up, I am publishing tomorrow. Because in my, my head, and I don't know if anyone relates to this, I had a huge ego conversation of like, I mean, now podcasting is like ubiquitous, but at the time <laughs> in 2014, it was like, you know, like it felt like a CB radio club, you know, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. You can't go from like hosting Beyonce on stage with 70,000 people, some dude in his living room that looks like real bad on your career trajectory, <laughs> you know? Um, but ironically, of course, those who started in 2014 have, have seen a precipitous rise because just like investing, if you start 
the earlier you start, the more it compounds. But um, thank you for the question. For me, this, which is the 250th episode of the podcast, wow. is now my commitment. And you guys are all, all here um, as my commitment to take the, the show to the next level. So hence the video, hence the, the desire to host you, who is uh, you are one of the people I respect most on the uh -huh. planet. Um, and and yeah, it's my commitment to going pro in a, in a bigger way ah. in following in coming up. Ah. All right. But the resistance has been significant. I bet it has. Yeah. 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 To take this to the next level. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. But, but to flip it, the switch on you again. So to me, what's interesting is, and, and what, part of the reason I take inspiration and you and I've talked about another area where I'm massively in resistance right now is writing my first book, which is five years in the making and, ah, yeah. and no closer to being published. So that's a, that's another, uh, kind of shit sandwich that I'm working uh. through. <laughs> But what you said so beautifully, and the reason I always take inspiration is, you were how old when you published your first book? 52. 52. And you're on how many now? 20 something. 20 something books. Yeah. And that honestly, you know, it's like that, I know Rich Roll is a mutual friend. It's like when he did that post where he's like, I didn't launch my podcast till I was 44, I didn't write my first book till I was 46 or whatever. Like you to me are, are that, and more because to me it's not only like you did one thing you're consistently putting out work year on year out and the journey which uh, which you've embarked on is so profound in terms of how, how 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 you how you went about getting there right like the journeyman adventures i don't know if you want to share any but like you you did a, you had a whole kind of blue collar journeyman adventure that, that led you to, to, you know, that first book, which as I understand it, when you, when you turn pro, you went to, I, I think it was big Sur, like with your Corona or your Smith Corona, I think, and a cat or something. Uh, yeah. Can you tell a little bit about, because I think that's so powerful in that that wasn't your first published book, but you, you put your all into that. Am I, am, am I, am, am I right? Yeah. I mean, there was the short version of this sort of odyssey that I was on was that, as a really young, dumb person in New York, I decided to write a novel, mm. um, which was like, you know, way beyond my capacity in any sense. I had no clue what it was. And my life sort of blew up at that point. I was married, that ended, and I sort of fell out of the bottom of the middle class. And I was in that kind of state where I couldn't get like a white collar type of job because if I applied for it, the stink of defeat was so strong on me that, you know, you would have those horrible moments in a, you know, where they would, it was just obvious you were like such a loser that they could. And so I wound up, but I also didn't have any real blue collar skills. I wasn't a mechanic or anything like that. So I wound up for years sort of doing the kind of jobs that you only really need a pulse to be high, you know, <laughs> like working in the oil fields or picking fruit or that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. And um, and all the time I was running away from I was so ashamed of myself for fucking up this first novel and blowing everything up uh, that uh, the idea of writing was like the farthest thing from my life. It was like my concept of torture and hell and the worst, you know, you know, the straightest way, you know, into hell. So. And finally, uh, you know, there was a moment, and then when I was like 31, where I did actually sit down and start to do that, uh, to sit down and, and write, even though it was going nowhere, it was just a, whatever dumb crap I was banging out. And uh, at that point, things sort of turned around, and then little by little, I began to get back and get on a path towards becoming a writer. Like I was a screenwriter for about 10 years. I had a kind of a Z level screenwriting career, but it was at least on the path towards, towards going where I was going. I don't know if that's answering what, it you, does. Were, what you were starting, Michael, but uh, no, I think that was it. I think it's really important because I, I feel like <laughs> we, especially, and you talk about this a bit, you know, like the, the art is not the tweet, right? The art is putting your ass in the chair. And I think in the Instagram era that we now find ourselves in, you also talk about, um, as I was reading, uh, the artists, the kind of this, this artist journey, right? Which you equate with the hero's journey. You talk about this notion of, you know, how it, how it's, it's about, I guess, int introducing the concept really of the muse, right? It's about kind of our devotion. And you see the, the most succinct quote that I, that I pulled from that, that I loved, which was art is work. And to me that, that is simple, but so profound. 
And I, and I, I love that you came from this kind of working class context, but then, and, and never, I think most resonant with me is you never, you never fucking quit. Like, you know, like even though you talked about even when you moved to LA, like I think it was four or five years where you wrote, I don't know how many screenplays. Yeah, and a lot of them. A lot, right? Yeah. Well, you don't quit either, Michael. I, I don't I'm quit. Sure, nobody here in this room is going to quit. No, and I think that, but I think that's, I think that's ins- inspiring, right? Because I do think though that in the social media era, what we do get presented with is the highlight reel of everyone's journey, and I'm guessing that everyone here is dealing with some kind of resistance in the wherever they want to up level in their journey, right? And yet we look around and it, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm still old enough to where, you know, I lived before the internet kind of came out, <laughs> but, but now it's like people, people's consciousness are being imbued with this notion of it seeming like everyone else is just crushing the game. You know, it doesn't feel like resistance lives in the social media era. You know what I'm saying? But yet it is alive and well. And, and also I think you provide to me and I'd, I'd love your insights around this is like, how can we in this era go back to the tried and true things that work in, in sort of confronting resistance. Well, it does seem to me, and my friend Frank here will definitely back this up, that today sort of the ethic is incredibly superficial, mm. right? It's everything is, is on the surface. It's, a, it's all about a hack. It's all about, and people ask me this, oh, is there a tip? Is there some sort of trick, some shortcut? And of course there isn't. I mean, the real the real secret to any sort of um, significant work is working in depth, right? I always say that uh, the first hour when you're sitting down at that keyboard, you can get to a certain level. But by the fourth hour, you're at a whole other level. And likewise, the first month, the first six months, you're at a certain depth of something. But in, at the end of year two, you're at a whole uh, working on the same thing, right? Your podcast or whatever it is. And that's not an ethic that anybody gets taught these days, you know? Right. Um, uh, not that it was back in the day either, you know? And nobody, of course, wants to pay that price. Um, but that is the price, right? It is the price. And uh, so uh, I always say that... Uh, if somebody asked me for like for any piece of advice as you're embarking on a career, it's buckle your seatbelt for a long fucking ride because that's <laughs> the reality. That's that's I'm, I'm serious. You know, yeah. um, uh, it's a marathon. You know, it's a lifetime thing. Like I had a friend one time and uh, who's a gym person. You know, I'm a gym person. Yeah. And uh, at some point I fell off the wagon. You know, I, I didn't go for like three months or four months or something like that. And uh, this was a woman and uh, we were talking and uh, I said, oh, I feel so bad. You know, I've really fallen off the wagon. I've completely gone to hell. You know, and she said to me, you know, this is a lifetime commitment, Steve. You and I are on a lifetime commitment here. So if you fell off for three months, no sweat. Get back and do it, you know. And I, that's, that's sort of the concept of working in depth and of working over a long period of time is the reality of it, I think, for anybody, you know, uh, maybe not for Neil Young, maybe not for Bob Dylan, you know, or Joni Mitchell, who when they were 18 years old, they were already great, you know, but, but for the rest of us, it's a long, it's a long road. Yeah. But there's nothing wrong with that. That's fun. That's life, right? 100%. You know, you'll look back on these days with your podcast as like the best days of your life. I'm sure, Michael. <laughs> You know, even though you're sweating bullets and, you know, waking up in the middle of the night, you know, these are the best days. No, it is. I was thinking about that today. Actually, I was like, <laughs> you know, I did all I, I don't know if anyone can relate to this. I did a ton of research. You know, you've been in my literally in my uh-huh. ears all week. Uh, got all the books I'm doing. And I was like today, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to a, did my workout, did my sauna. And I, <laughs> and I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, this is this is the juice, you know, because it's like you're a little bit nervous you're you got the resistance you're like what you know will everyone get there people are hitting you up can i get you know you're doing you're kind of juggling all these all these balls and i and i thought to myself this is this is it this is like this is the stuff that we live for right it's like to be able to share your song with your people you know what i mean like to me that's what life is it's like how can i create quality shared experiences with people i love that's that's wealth to me and and so 
yeah, this is the juice and the struggle. But but you did say something to me once, or I read this in one of your in one of your books, where you were like, "The muse does strike me every day, but that's because I show up every every morning at nine a.m. with my boots on, you know, kind yeah. of thing." Well, that was a quote from Somerset Mom. Okay, beautiful. Where somebody asked him, "Do you write on a schedule or only when inspiration strikes you?" And he said, uh, "I write only when inspiration strikes me." He says, "Fortunately, it strikes me every morning at nine o'clock sharp." You know? So. But that's work. That. That's work. That's being a pro. Yeah, you talk. I remember when I, our last conversation, I actually had the good grace to come to your place. And I remember you and seeing your your uh, your desk. And what was pretty cool, messy. Yeah. No, <laughs> you, know, you, you were you do work. It's your, <laughs> it's your it's your den, you know. Um, but what I like is I had this kind of image of you like and you. And I think this is a cover of one of your books. You've got these boots, you know. And it, it, you talk about things, and you've written books, obviously, um, you know, about military conquests and whatnot. And I think it's a beautiful counterbalance to some of the spiritual concepts that I think are Im embedded in your work, although you don't, you don't um, talk about them in that way. Uh, it, but you do say at one point that when you go to your desk every morning, that you say a prayer to the muse. I do. And I, and I think... I really would love to hear kind of like what what is that to you? Because the other thing that I noted when you started talking about the muse is that none of the 20 books that you wrote were books that before you wrote them, you knew you were going to write. Mm. And I think that that's really striking for everyone here because we get so fixed on what we think we need to do that we're not listening to what wants to move through us. So I'd love to hear about what your prayer is to the muse and how that that works in your uh, process. Maybe I should talk about the muse a yeah, little probably bit first so good, that people know idea, what we're yeah. talking about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is kind of a lot to unpack here, but I'll try. I mean, I, d I definitely think that the artist's life is a two, two level deal, right? On the one hand, there's a kind of the airy fairy stuff of, you know, amazing shit comes through you and you don't know where it comes from, right? Like Bob Dylan says, he doesn't even remember writing any of his songs, right? It was coming from, so there's that level. Uh, and then there's the blue collar level of, you know, whether it's right brain or left brain, the blue collar level of just showing up every day, you know, and grinding it out and going through like the middle of the season, the middle of the football season when you're hurt and, you know, everybody's got broken bones and, every, and you just got to keep grinding. So um, to talk about uh, the muse for a second. Mm. And if I blather on, I hope you guys will be patient with it. But the... Uh, the muses were nine sister goddesses, Greek goddesses, Greek mythology, were nine sisters, the, daughter, uh, the daughters of Zeus and Mnemosyne. Mnemosyne means memory. And their job was to inspire artists. And there was a muse of dance, Terpsichore, and a muse of music, Calliope, and various other muses for various arts. And kind of the classic image of the muse would be Beethoven at the piano and this sort of hazy figure, female figure kind of whispering in his ear. So the way that sort of concept came to me, I had never even heard of it or thought about it. I had, uh, I had, um, I had quit a job, blah, blah, blah. I was living in a house on savings and I had a mentor named Paul Rink, and this is in the war of art who lived up the street from me. And one day he told me that he, prayed to the muse every morning. I go, what the hell is that? I never heard of that. And he typed out for me the invocation of the muse from the start of the Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey, the translation by T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. And that's actually in the War of Art, the whole quotes of it. And I had had never, uh, and he used to, he was a real believer in that, that you can't summon the muse inspiration, the flow, whatever. You can't order it. You can't beg for it. You can't buy it. The only thing you can do is invoke it, meaning a prayer, you know? And, and um, so I do that. I say this every morning at the start of work. And it's sort of like entering a dojo, you know, and you kind of, you take off your shoes and you bow to the, the sacred space or whatever it is. And, but you're also expressing your own humility. You're saying to your, and this is what Homer himself wrote, writes in this invocation, that uh, that you don't believe you can do this by yourself. That you recognize 
there's a force out there that you are trying to summon to help you. And you, you're basically saying, I'm here to serve you. I'm an instrument. I have busted my ass for however many years to train myself to be ready to do whatever you want me to do. And so kind of please help me. That's kind of what it is. But my also my belief about the muse, I think the muse is kind of like Santa Claus in that she sort of flies overhead and she's looking down to see if we're naughty or nice. And <laughs> and truly, right? Are we fucking off? Or And if the muse flies overhead and she sees you there on Monday trying to do your thing, whatever it is, you score some points with her, you know? And if she flies over and you're there Tuesday, you got some more points for with her. And the, she also likes the, the work boots thing. She wants to know that you're ready to do the work for her because she can't do it. She's in another dimension, right? She can't sit at a keyboard and do it. She needs a, an embodied form, you know, a physical guy. So if you have that, at least this is my theory, if you have that sort of humble blue collar aspect, you're ready to serve, you're ready to do the work, you're not, you know, doing it for your ego or anything like that. Sooner or later, she's going to bless you, you know. Sooner or later, the good stuff is going to come. For me, it took 30 years, but sooner or later, it did come. And um, uh, the muse has never let me down. I must uh, say that, you know. And in fact, if somebody were to ask me what my vocation is, what my occupation is, I would say I am a servant of the muse. And I'm... Whatever assignment she gives me, whatever next book or what a movie or whatever it is, I'll do it. And uh, um, going forward, that's that's how I look at things. Um, <clears throat> sometimes people will say, like as an exercise, project yourself five years or ten years into the future and have that person talk to you. That's bullshit to me, at least the way I live my life, because I'm a servant of this force that I don't understand. And I can't predict what she's going to want me to do. So all I know is I'm going to I'm going to follow her orders. And the other thing, while I'm blathering on here, is you were talking about being surprised by something. This is another thing that sort of I've just observed about my own process is that when a, a new book idea comes to me, it's always a surprise. You know, this is like a, an orders packet from the goddess, right? Here's the next one, you know? And I look at it and I go, me? You know, and I think a lot of times it's a subject that I don't know anything about. Uh, I don't feel I'm capable of doing it. But, you know, the goddess knows better than we do, I think. You know, and so each book for me has surprised me, you know? Why did that, where did that idea come from? Only when I look back on it and I go, oh, that makes a lot of sense now. But while I'm, while I'm doing it, and particularly in the beginning, I'm, I'm full of self-doubt and, and wondering why I was picked to do this particular assignment. But I think that's part of, that's, that's the way the universe works, I think, you know? If you're not surprised, something's wrong. <laughs> that was a mic drop right there but uh <laughs> we're gonna keep going that that was beautiful i feel like this notion of being a vessel being in service to to something i think of it like the more i feel like there's a more that wants to live in all of us that's more than the ego right it's mm. it's like um and you talk about this concept it's and I can't remember the exact words you use, but it's like everyone has their own unique fingerprint, their own unique work, right? The more that wants to live through you. And in my, my, my sense of it is that the, that the, 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 the work of our lives is as artists to get out of the way of our, you know, to stop, stop being servants of our ego and to, and to surrender to that place, for lack of a better term. And, and show up in, in all the hard work that that entails. I think that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah to, to that 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 divine cosmic um, force that wants to move through us, that wants to live through us. Like I think you talk about the oak, the the seed of an oak tree. Yeah, wanting to evolve into the oak, like it's it's its essence. And, and I feel like all of us have that that essence, and 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 the our own unique song that wants to live through us. You know, and and the question is. 
to me also, and I, I, this is just evoke, being evoked from what you just shared, the book I'm working on, which you already know, but I haven't shared publicly, is, is around this notion of what is the music that wants to live in the space between people? And how do we become instruments for that song? And I think a lot of times we, we I love music for the, for the metaphor, but I, th I think we, 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 tr we bang our heads against the wall trying to, trying to recreate a, a hit song that we've heard, someone else's song or the song we think we're supposed to sing, mm. but we don't listen to, you know, that, that, that song that wants to, to live through us, you know? And I think about like John, Paul and Ringo, they all probably had beautiful, you know, beautiful individual songs, but man, when they came together and they actually listened, I'm sure that the combination of those, of the way that the muse wanted to move through them collectively, obviously it's something that's touched many of our lives. So I'm, I'm, I'm really moved by this notion of that song that wants to live through us and being in devotion to the more. Um, and, and the way that you describe it as it relates to the muse, I think, is of the most beautiful uh, articulations I've heard. And there, there's one thing I, I want to share that you shared in, 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 your, in, in talking about the artist's journey, which is, I think, something really beautiful, which is you said the artist's journey is the hero's journey of the human race. And I'll say that again. The artist's journey is the hero's I, journey of that? the human race. You said that. You said that. I, I wrote it down in bold. I listened to it a couple times to make sure I caught it. Um, but, but I think, you know, amidst th this time, that, that to me hit a, a real chord because I think a lot of people are wondering where the heck the human race is going. Um, but I think one thing we can do is, is, is focus on our own journey. And you do talk about the hero's journey. Well, you take timeless principles from the hero's journey and apply it to the artist's journey. Can you talk just a little bit about how you see that journey of the artist? Because I think obviously we've, you've talked a bit about resistance and you've, you've, you've talked about the muse. Um, but I'm, I'm curious as to how we stay in the journey of becoming a clear vessel or a clear channel uh -huh. for that that wants to move through us or live through us. Uh, well, this is just sort of my own, uh, from my own experience, mm. that um, I, think, I think my life at least has been divided into what I would call a hero's journey and any artist's journey that follows it. Two different, two different things. And to me, the, the hero's journey is the search for your, for your calling, for your vocation. And on that journey, you have a lot of adventures and uh, uh, you go into a lot of uh, dead ends and you know, run into walls. And, and at some point, you do kind of grasp what your vocation is. You know, I am a writer, I am a musician, I am whatever the hell this is. And at that point, your life changes. And now you're on a you're on a different journey. You're on the artist journey, and then what I define that to mean is, okay, let's say you, you decide uh, uh, you're a writer. Okay, the next then you have to ask yourself, well, what am I going to write? What's what's my what's my voice? You know, what's my subject matter? What is what is, what is my theme? And now everything in your life, in a way, becomes boring. Be you become. Like on the hero's journey, you're a drug addict, you're a drunk, you're chasing women, you're doing all kinds of, you know, your life is really exciting and interesting and da, 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 da. Then when you hit like the artist's journey, that's when you kind of stop, you find a room, you know, a safe place and you sort of turn inward and you go, okay, now what am, what am I, how am I going to um, discipline this instrument that I have, you know? How am I going to learn my craft? That's when you start to, to read. Frank and I were talking the other day. Read, read the books. Listen to the, go see the movies. Absorb the canon of what came before, you know, and, and then learning those, um, I call them soft skills, but they're not really soft. Self-discipline, all the things you need to do to overcome the various, you know, freak outs that happen along the way so that you become capable of, 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 um, of enacting whatever your vocation is. Now, some people like Bruce Springsteen, I think, or Bob Dylan or Neil Young, they hit that moment young. Mm. God bless them, they're lucky, you know, I envy them, you know? Um, and they're, 
you know, you can track like Bruce Springsteen's albums, you know, and they're on an absolute course. You see, he's on his artist journey, right? He's got his theme and he's just refining it, you know, finding the people that he can work with, Clarence and everybody else, you know, yeah. and learning how to go into the studio and produce a sound and, and how to write and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's the artist journey. And I hope that a lot of people in this room are on their artist journey. But if they're not, you you will be, you know. Just keep plugging, keep plugging for it. Um, but your life then does become much simpler. Mm. And, you know, you're, you're in the studio now, you know, you're working, you're in the dojo and that's, that's the artist's journey for me. And I don't think there's another journey after that. I think, you know, that's it. Yeah. What strikes me is that, <coughs> is that notion of committing it's like the finding the sacred in the mundane, at least a, yeah. a lot of what I feel like your work embodies is putting in the reps. Like, yeah, I think especially, yeah. and we're recording for those listening around the world, we're recording in Venice, California. This is a place that people like to chase uh, the ecstasies, you know, the ethereal, so to speak. And what I like about you, what your work embodies to me is you actually take very, um, profound topics, but you ground them in reality. You ground them in the day to day. Like, you know, you put your boots on, you show up, you do the work and sometimes it doesn't look sexy, but guess what? Like that's, that's when the muse moves through you, right? It's Providence. It's like when you, when, when you commit and you're, and you turn pro and you fully go for it, that's when actually the ideas strike yeah. and like, you get out of your own way. Let me jump in and just Please. say something. This is something people don't talk about a lot. Uh, about the artist's life is there's a tremendous amount of tedium. Mm. You know, if you are, uh, and it breaks people's spirit because they're not ready for it and they can't handle it. But you know, if you're thinking about, let's say you want to be a concert pianist, how many times do you have to play scales, you know, or how many times do you have to play Rachmaninoff's, whatever it is, you know, until you can do it, you know, so much of that tedium, right? Or to be a dancer, you know, to be, you know, it, like the gym, right? How how many reps do you have to do? And it's uh, we were talking about working in depth as opposed to working on the surface. That's that's another thing that they don't teach you right at the start. They don't tell you it's going to be boring. It's going to be tedious. You're really going to grind, you know. But that's a, a big part of the reality. When we see Beyonce or somebody doing their amazing shit on stage, we don't think about all the hours that they put in to get to that point. You know, um, somehow nobody, nobody talks about that. I don't know why. I always think it's fascinating. Yeah. You're, you're in devotion to the things that happen behind the scenes that gets you to that place. I feel yeah. like you're, you're not a, you're not a big pomp and circumstance devotee, which I think culturally, unfortunately we become transfixed by, by the pomp and the circumstance and lost the, you know, we're, we're transfixed by the sauce, but we've lost the meat. We've lost the meat and potatoes <laughs> yeah. of it all. And, yeah. you, and, and, and that's what I love about, about your orientation and also the inspiration you've been for me. For those, and, and in a moment, I want to actually maybe take a question or two from, from the audience. Uh, we're going to get, uh, we'll probably won't have a time for a ton of questions, but we're going to take a couple of questions. But for those who are amidst, is anyone... Uh, going through a creative struggle right now or like in, everybody in a roadblock. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your truth. Um, so for those listening, a lot of hands were raised. Um, so I think that for those who are in an acute place of, let's call it stuckness, um, writer's block, what have you, um, what's the, you know, obviously you got to do the work and show up, but do you have any thoughts that could be helpful for people who are currently in a place of, of being stuck or, or are Im embattled with the fear of the next step to support them in their creative journey and their artist journey? Um, and I know there's no magic bullet, but do you have any sort of anecdotes or thoughts around how people can can maybe you take a the hack, next step? Michael, <laughs> not not a, not a hack. The, here's yeah. what I'm thinking about: bust so I, your ass for the next thirty years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty good. But, no, I'm, but I do think I do think that I I think of my uh, work as a practice. Mm. Like if you think about having a, a yoga practice or having a martial arts practice is something that, or a meditation practice, right? Is something that it's, it's ritualistic. It's something that you make a deal with yourself that you're going to do every day, 
Mm. Preferably at the same time in the same place because energy gathers around that thing. And that, that, uh, the practice, the, the, uh, the aspiration of the practice is that by doing something physical like martial arts or meditation or, or yoga, you're trying to get to a spiritual place, trying to get to, trying to get out of the ego and into this capital S self. And so my kind of quote unquote advice of it would be to think of your, your art, whatever it is, writing, whatever it is, as a practice that you're doing it for its own sake every day as a kind of a ritualistic thing and eliminate the concept of, did I do good today? Mm. You know, am I getting anywhere? Mm. It's just to do the practice each day. And no matter if it's tedious, if it's boring, that's part of the deal, you know? And, but if you keep hammering, good things happen. There's no way that they, that they won't happen because the goddess is flying around and she's watching. And if you're grinding, she likes that, you know, and sooner or later, you know, she'll make it pay off. There's no, there should be no such thing. There is no such thing as writer's block. It's, it's resistance. It's somebody being defeated by their own self doubt or their own tendency to procrastinate or, or to give in to distraction. And so you know, it's a hardcore thing to say, but you just have to overcome it. That's all there is to it. Yeah, you said you said the amateur tweets, the pro works. Yeah, true. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, it's work. And, but art are, is work. Art is work. And we are in the age of distraction. I mean, yeah. I'm sure there are always distractions, but we are now in a algorithmic modified yeah, yeah. Uh, distraction universe. And what you're presenting basically is an antidote for distraction. Yeah, I guess. I see it. I mean, I have a rule of thumb that I apply to myself in those instances. When in doubt, it's resistance. <laughs> <laughs> and Frank and I, we had breakfast today and we were just talking about this that we were asking, uh, he was asking me or I was asking you, I forget, Frank, do, are there times when you kind of drop a project and you go, and I say, I, I've ne I never drop a project because I think it's better to go to the end of something and finish it, even if it's no good, than to quit halfway through. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true, but quitting was always my pet noir. You know, that was, I could never get to the end of something. So I have a kind of a bugbear thing about that. I've got to fucking finish something, you know, and then, and then move on to the next thing. Yeah, you, you actually talk about in the, uh, the, the artist's journey of this notion of the artist starts, they know how to start, yeah. and the artist finishes, they know how to finish. Yeah, but of course, we don't know that at the start. Again, right. nobody teaches you that. You sort of have to fail and fail again until you, unless you're lucky. Some people are lucky. Some people are lucky. Yeah. The rest of us work. Yeah. Yes. I'm curious to hear what you're enjoying reading, but I, you, Michael, just made me think of something that you, Mr. Pressfield, recently posted about when you're, before you finish something, you do start the next one so that you don't have that empty space between. Yeah, yeah. I read that very recently. Yeah, yeah. And I was curious about how much time do you give yourself when you're still in the midst of a deep project to start the next one? Are you just giving yourself, oh, 10 minutes a day, I'm gonna put a note down about that? Or is that part of your four hour Stint, like how do you uh, structure your time when you're doing two at once? I will take, you know, an hour or something like that, or maybe a third of time to start the next project before I finish the one. Because I'm definitely a believer that uh, you never, there should never be a between books, you know, because you fall into that hellish pit, you know. The worst thing that people can do, and a lot of people do this, is like they, they'll finish something, they'll release it, a tape or whatever it is, and then they'll wait for response. And it's like, oh God, please let them love this stuff, you know? And of course, the response never comes or it's negative, you know? Or, um, and, and then you're in that terrible, you know, the muse doesn't like that at all, you know? So I'm definitely a believer to start the next one while you're still working on the one before it. You and about halfway through or something? You just Sometimes I can be way, way into something, you know? But it helps because then, and, and by the same token, I sort of feel like on this new project, it, 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 sort of the question is, well, do you ever take a vacation? And my answer to that is when, if I, the new project that I'm working on, once I've got some momentum, once I sort of feel like I have a beachhead, you know, I've got my troops have landed at Normandy and they've moved in, you know, 50, then I'll stop. 
because I know I've got enough momentum. If I take a couple of weeks off, I'll be able to go back to it. But I don't think you ever want to be in that dip where you've stopped and you don't know what you're going to do next. And I don't want to hog all the questions, but I do want to hear about what you love to read and reread. Ah, <laughs> um, I just kind of I'm actually more of a movie person than a reading person, you know. And so, and I also will watch movies over and over again. Um, so uh, one that I, uh, that I just kind of fell in love recently, Diana, my girlfriend is going to be laughing at this, is Moneyball. I don't know if you've seen that one, Brad Pitt movie, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, uh, anything like that, I'm studying, you know, if I'm reading it, you know, I'm not just watching it for fun. I'm, I'm studying it. It's like, how do they do that? What, how do, you know, and each time you see something more. So I'm working when I'm doing that, but it's fun. That actually just inspired me. Uh, has anyone here seen the movie A River Runs Through It? So there's that beautiful scene. I think we talked about this at our last breakfast. Not this particular scene, but, but the, 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 the bridge, which is there's a scene where Brad Pitt is kind of casting his, his fishing rod. And <laughs> his brother kind of peers around the corner on this Montana River. And he, he's created his own technique um, where the fly doesn't actually hit the ground, uh, the water, excuse me, but it, it just kind of dances above the water and the fish jumps up to greet it. Uh -huh. And he talks very eloquently about how his brother in, in all of his reps, in, in, in all of the times that he's shown up to the river, hmm. AKA his desk uh -huh. equivalent, the muse created his own unique language, you know, uh -huh. it started to move through him and his brother witnessed him in his song you know his own unique song the way that he cast yeah. that fly rod and to me uh, i i love i love i think i shared this with you there's a gentleman whom i i studied with named jerry who's a dna a navajo man and what i love about jerry was he was the embodiment of that he was like brad pitt with the fly rod but for him it was a rattle and he moved a rattle in such a way and he was a very humble man, but he would just say, good morning, relatives. <sighs> and I was there. It was a sunrise. I was surrounded by some very profound indigenous elders. And, and he had this rattle. And the way I describe it would be like, imagine you're sitting next to Aretha Franklin or like Ella Fitzgerald on the bus. And you have no fucking idea until they start to sing. That was Jerry. Ah. Jer Jerry moves this rattle and he's, I mean, he's a big guy, no adornments, t-shirt, trucker's hat, you know, but he's like a, he's a road man. He's a deeply, like deeply wise elder starts to sing. And it was like, it was like he, his song was the key that unlocked your consciousness. It was like his, his unique song. But to me, I feel like that's, that's the juice when people, when people are in their unique song, but that song is, is, is that act of the muse? Is that, is that authentic expression of the muse, which I think yes. we feel when we, when we're in the presence of yeah. it. There's that's no, your book, better. right? That's what you're, that's, that, that that's, you're that's what I'm by. going for. That's yeah. what I'm, that's, I'm yeah. committed to that, that notion of, of that song, that unique song that I think all of us have, all of us have a unique song. The question is, do we get to a place do we get out of our, our way enough to, to allow that song to move through us, you know, to really, truly sing it? And I think some people know their song, but they don't have the courage to sing it. I've definitely been in that place myself. Yes. So I liked how you talked about um, praying to the muse. I thought that was like in my head. It was very a holistic approach. I almost thought of like Eastern medicine. And I guess what I'm going to ask you is, what is your Western medicine approach? So like the praying is preventative action, like pray to the muse to cultivate everything you need for your art. But say you wake up one morning and like you said, like your art is your practice. You know you're supposed to do it, but you just can't get out of bed or you can't do it. Do you have like a mantra or like a method or something that's like gonna snap you out of it? Like a Western medicine approach. Like I'm already sick but like help me do my art. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's, you know, sort of uh, the just do it concept. You know, there really is no substitute for taking action, you know, when, when, uh, when you don't want to, you know, it's like, uh, 
I mean, this people have said this before, but I do certainly believe this, that a lot of times someone will think, well, I don't really feel like it right now. You know, I don't really feel it. I don't have the mood. I don't feel like I'm ready to do that. That is complete bullshit. You know, <laughs> nobody cares you know, what you feel, you know, you have to, I, at least for me, I have to completely dismiss that, you know, uh, and, and say that to myself, Steve, I don't care how you feel, you know, do something, you know, maybe you can't do everything, but do something. Yeah, it's, it's a hardcore thing, but it's the only way as near as I can tell. And that's an antidote to life in L.A., by the way, where people operate based on a lot of feelings. So it's yeah, it, it's nice. To I hear. mean, I lived for years kind of following my feelings, you know, like I thought that was the way to. But no, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Yorker in me. I feel like in L.A. Thank you guys, by the way, for all showing up. We actually have a full room. But uh, in New York, what I love is they'll be like, hey, you want to get a coffee two weeks from Tuesday at 8 a.m.? Yes. And that's like you, 7 a.m. breakfast. Yes. Yeah. I don't have to check in. You'll be there. Yeah. Right? Bef 10 minutes before 7 a.m. L.A., it's kind of like, it's, I call it a soft yes. Uh, yeah. Love to. <laughs> let me check my horoscope. Let me, let me check traffic. Let me see if I get a better option. And then I'm, then I'm a maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we got, we got time for maybe one or two more, and then I'm actually going to um, ask, because the other thing that we have not yet talked about, which, which a lot of my, uh, the quotes that I just shared um, are from a book, which is your newest book, and I read this book and loved it, it's called The Daily Press Field, um, and what I loved about it was it, and I, I think because I, I, I'm, I'm guessing based on, on the forward, but uh, our mutual friend Ryan Holiday was part of the inspiration and catalyst for this. Uh, has any, uh, if anyone here reads Daily Stoic, uh, great, great thing. I definitely recommend tapping in. But what I love was that that kind of structure applied with your unique insights from 20 plus <laughs> books uh, worth of, of goodness and then applied over the course of a year, which I think is a really unique format. Um, did, did this come from a conversation with Ryan? What was the, what was the genesis for this, for this book? Uh, he was just saying to me that um, the Daily Stoic that he wrote, which is you know a 365 day thing, was uh, one of his most popular books. And he said, you should do this too. He says, you've got so much stuff you should put it together in, in, a, in a cohesive form and people will like it. You know, it'll do good for, for people. So I thought, you know, this is, it is, the 365-day format is kind of a great way to kind of, uh, like if anybody is about to start on a long-term project, a one-year, two-year project, you know, a book, screenplay, a long-form fiction, anything you're doing with podcasting, that a 365-day uh, format is a great way to take somebody or to sort of mentor someone from day one all the way through to completion, you know, a little bit like the I Ching where you can also open it to pick a day, you know, day 151 and to see what it says, you know. So anyway, it was fun to do. And uh, I hope it I hope it helps. I hope it helps people. I hope it's something you can put beside your laptop or beside your keyboard or whatever it is and and, you know, open day one, day two, day three. Yeah, so I'll say, uh, just from my own personal perspective, so I've got War of Art, Turning Pro, Nobody Wants to Read Your Shit, The Artist Journey, all on my audio. I mean, I, I actually have physical copies as well, but I have audio because when I need a swift kick in the ass, instead of uh, annoying you with a phone call, I just put on the book, and I find it works marvelously. But now, actually, what I've done is um, is I have this on my desk and I'll do it as a, as a, as a, as a daily catalyst. So I'm, I'm actually applying the lessons and it's been, it's been actually amazingly helpful. Uh, it also inspired me, which I'm just going to announce now. And I don't exactly know the entirety of what it's going to entail, but uh, I wanted to actually, and I don't know if Stephen really doesn't know this yet, but I'm actually, I, I want to kick off 2024 as my best year ever. <laughs> and I would love it for you guys to have your best year ever. And so I actually asked just before this, uh, Oliver, um, our host at the Kin, I was like, hey, can we host a dinner here on the 12th of January? Um, and he said, yes. So I'm gonna invite you guys all. 
And then I'm going to do a creative workshop around how to unlock your creativity. And for anyone who buys a book, I'm going to auction off a spot for that uh, gratis for, for those who get the book, because I think this is going to be one of the biggest catalysts for my great year ahead. And I would love to be on that journey with all of you, because in my opinion, which we haven't necessarily talked about, for me, accountability is everything. So like, I can declare I'm going to do a project, but if I don't have someone to whom I'm accountable, like I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. <laughs> if you hadn't, had, like you gave me this book at 5 a.m. Or maybe it wasn't 5, but it was early. It's pretty Colts. early, yeah. Let's just say if, if I didn't, if I wasn't showing up for you, I would not have been up there, <laughs> shall we say. So I think it's really beautiful to have a community. Um, and I'd love to be on that journey. Uh, and, and we'll figure out what that looks like together. But in essence, I really want to encourage you guys to pick this up. I think it's amazing. Um, I'm going to take one or two more questions. And then I think Steven actually is, are you down to do some, if you, if for, cause I, a bunch of people have already bought books. Are you down to do some signing of some books and whatnot mm -hmm. afterwards? Yeah. Okay, great. So let's do, um, I just want to be mindful and respectful of everyone's time. Let's do a couple more questions. Then I have a couple last questions for Steven and then we'll, we'll close out and you'll have an opportunity to connect one-on-one -on -one and you guys can connect with each other. Okay, um, thank you so much for having this conversation. Uh, as an expert on resistance that you are, uh, thank you so much for normalizing resistance and reframing it actually as an indicator for being um, about for something big. Um, I was wondering if you have some wisdom to share about the origin of resistance because you could equally say, um, would the Buddha have resistance? Um, why does the muse like it when we are grinding? Um, just one thought on that. Um, Stanislav Grof, the founder of transpersonal psychology, who has done a lot of research around the birth process, compares the creative process with the birth process, which is a painful death and life battle. And potentially the creative process is coming as a almost like a trauma response from being engaged in a deep, deeply meaningful creative endeavor. What are your thoughts on the origin of resistance? Why is it so innately part of the creative process? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great question, and I don't really have any fantastic wisdom on it. Um, but it does seem that there is, there is a devil, you know? There is a, a negative death force out there, you know? And it seems to me that we live on the material plane here, you know, flesh and blood, and above us is a higher plane that we're trying to get to. And the insight for me is that there's something in between those two that's trying to block us, that's trying to block what's coming from above to us and trying to block our prayers going up toward us. And I have no idea why it's there, but it is there, you know, and... Um, I, I look at it in a very sort of a simple way. It's just a uh, something that we have to get through. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't have anything you know more theoretical than that. Thank you. I, w I will say just from the listening to your question, um, and also, have you heard? And maybe Stephen, you can talk about this. I had never heard of this. Uh, I think. Uh, pr forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it, but the the, the daemon. Or the day. Uh -huh. So at first when I heard it, I was like, I thought he said demon, but then I was like, oh, daemon. And and the and the the essence of it was this notion of of our inner genius. And when you talked about birthing and and breaking through resistance, it, it, it reminded me a little bit of that concept of the of the daemon. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's a really fascinating idea. Yeah, it's it's another thing that I really don't. I'm no expert on. I don't have a, a real handle on it, but. Um, Daemon is a Greek word that, um, and the concept that the ancient Greeks had was that we are born with this thing, this daemon in us. And it's, um, and the Latin word for that was genius. So it was, you know, that gift, that calling or whatever it is. But I think it also has a demonic element to it. There's a certain, um, um, like uh, I wrote a book about Alexander the Great called The Virtues of War. And one of the themes of that, and it, was, and it was told in the first person by Alexander, one of the themes in the book was that his, he felt he was in a duel all his life 
with his daemon. And his daemon was Alexander, but it wasn't, it wasn't the person that he was. It was this other thing. And he felt that it, gave, it was crueler than he was, stronger than he was, smarter than he was, much more depth. It tapped into powers that he didn't have. And he felt that um, it could kill him. And that people did take their own lives because their daemon had possessed them. So again, I'm not really sure what what that is, but I do think that artists, in one way or another, tap into that sometimes. And I think when you see great actors doing their thing, you know, or or an Aretha Franklin or anybody that goes to that incredible level, that they're somehow tapping into some other entity that is them, but is really not them. And I'm not, I, again, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's, but it's big medicine. Genius. I mean, Leonardo, where did all that come from? Mm. Did he, they had that, you know, it's again, it's sort of the oak. What's in the acorn? That, that daemon, that genius is in there with all, right down to every leaf that's going to come up. What resonates with me about that is I think oftentimes there's this, I think, potentially fallacious notion, but, but also rooted in some truth where it's, there's the, this, this notion of the tortured artist, right? Like we almost have to be in our darkness to produce our best work. And to me, that doesn't, that doesn't resonate as true. Like I think a lot of people, for example, who have gotten sober, have uh -huh. wit, you know, Bradley Cooper talks about that. Like he never would have produced the works he produced if he hadn't gotten sober. But I do think others, like I just watched this incredible Mac Miller performance. I didn't even know much about Mac Miller. And I watched his tiny desk performance. You guys watch that. His last song, uh, it's called 1992. It's, it's with strings. I was like, this is someone who's truly in his genius. And yet he passed away from addiction like a few months later. And I feel like it is kind of, and, and to me, and I, I don't know necessarily the origins of your title of the war of art, but I do think that there is this kind of, battle within us of like are we you know which wolf we we're gonna feed and, mm -hmm. and do we feed that like you know that more i'm coming for you hungry ghost or do we actually stand as an as an offering to the muse you know wh which which are we going for yeah i'm on the muse side of that one i i <laughs> I, I am as well. i as well do we have another question i think we had one over here Hey, thank you. Um, I'm curious, have you gotten to a point where you've come to become friends with resistance, where it's not so antagonistic? A, li a little bit, a little bit. But it's always there, and, uh, and it always has to be dealt with. I don't know if you can really come to terms with it, because it's, it's merciless, and it has no pity, and it's out to destroy you as much as it possibly can. So you can't really, I've never become, I'm a little friendly with it, just that I've done the dance so many times, but it's never anything to be taken less than with deadly seriousness, if you ask me. And on this, just I want to say a sidebar thing, on the subject of books, I want to recommend two books to you guys, have nothing to do with me. Um, one is David Mamet's Three Uses of the Knife, if you, it's a really great book about the creative process. And another one is Roseanne Cash's book, Composed. Um, so I put that out there as uh, two works that I think are really, really terrific. Beautiful. And I recommend them to you too, Michael. I'm, I'm on <laughs> it. I'm on it for sure. Um, you had a question. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I feel like you must have encountered some pretty amazing stories of people encountering their muse. I feel like in my life, there seems to be a genesis of that. It starts somewhere. And I would love to just hear any reflections or stories that you have on that moment uh, or time. Oddly enough, I don't have stories like that. No? <laughs> yeah. I, no, nobody's confided them to me. Anyway, um, you mean other people's stories? Yours or other people's or things you've come across in your research? Um, God, I, um, I'm drawing a blank on that. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> well, you do talk about 
uh, um, and I don't know if this exactly hits on the nose of what you're talking about, but one of the things I loved in, in the book was when you go through kind of prolific artists, and I referenced this a bit earlier, and their body of work. And to me, you talk about this notion, like, like ready or not, you are called. Like it's a calling. And if you actually stay in the call long enough, then even though, as I understand it, you don't know what's going to come next. Like just as you didn't know which book was going to mm -hmm. come next yet, there's this through line through the calling. Like you, you read out, for example, Bruce Springsteen songs, and then you mm -hmm. read out Bob Dylan's songs. And then you wrote out actually your books and, and, and there, 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 it feels like to me, there's a micro and a macro, and there seems to be some kind of a cadence to them as in like, you don't necessarily know, um, why you're being called to that, but there's a fingerprint that is imbued through it. Like you talk about Bruce Springsteen, it's like the blue collar struggle, but yet there's a redemption, you know, like there's, 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 yeah. like that's his kind of, that's his kind of th thing. I don't know if this resonates with you, but it does feel like there also, there's a, there's a macro on the body of work that is, that is also emergent to those who stay in the, in the calling and yeah. keep their boots in the work. Yeah. There's definitely a theme of some, anybody that produces many, many works over their life. There's definitely a, a theme if you look for it. And I would encourage anybody that's at the beginning of their artistic career to imagine the body of work that you've got, that you will produce. You know, if it's music, imagine all of the albums or shows or whatever it is. If it's books, imagine the bookshelf that's there because it's there. It's, it's there. And, um, and we're, we're all called to, to do that. You know, it's, a, it's an underground river that's flowing through us. You know, films that would be on a shelf. And I would just say, believe, believe in that if you can, because a lot of times you think, oh, if I can just, this is me too. Oh, if I can just do the first one, you know, or just the first one or maybe the second one, but really there can be 40 or 50 of them, you know, and we're all living longer these days. We hope we are. So there's a lot of stuff out there that we all have that body of work in potential. If we could see it, if we had, a, you know, the right instrument, we could see it floating in the air right now. Maybe we should end on that note. Michael, what do you uh, think? I think that sounds perfect. I think that sounds perfect. Uh, thank you, Stephen, uh, for. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, man. It's a pleasure. Uh, I can't wait to read your book when you really get that stuff about what's in the music between people, you know? Yeah. It, well, I'll tell you what, just to be authentic with it. What's beautiful is I know that there's moments of, of song in there. But what I've found in the writing process, and you've actually been very inspirational, is it's getting out of our own way or getting out of my own way. Make it personal. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, it's been a beautiful journey and you've been very, very helpful. So let's give a hand to Stephen Pressfield. Oh, thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with the one and only Stephen Pressfield. If you did, please share it with a friend. I know that there are many creatives out there that would benefit from his insights. Uh, please pick up a copy of The Daily Pressfield. Uh, you will not regret it. It's amazing. Um, also, if you have a moment, please go ahead and leave a rating and review on wherever you are listening. Uh, subscribe also to uh, our YouTube channel which I'm now building up and creating more epic video. You can check out this in video form if you're listening to it on audio. And thank you guys so much for listening. I never take your time for granted. Sending you so much love and gratitude. Until the next time, take care.